Hi everyone, welcome to another Clean Machine Live. My name is Jeff Palmer. I'm the CEO and founder of Clean Machine. I created Clean Machine to encourage other people to keep this amazing machine that we're born into clean, free of animal products and free of substances that can harm our bodies and our health so that you can be free of drugs, free of animal products, do the right thing for your health, for the animals and for the environment that we live in. Thank you for joining me on this. This one's going to be a little bit of fun. We're going to talk about some of the top excuses that I hear on social media all day long about why I can't go vegan or can't go plant-based or why I can't do a plant-based diet, right? So there are so many. I just picked 10 of them. They're not definitely the top 10. There are some of them that are in the top first, but let's jump right into it. But first, let's get the clarification out of the way this video is for informational educational purposes only it is not intended to diagnose treat cure or prevent any disease so let's jump right into it and obviously the number one thing that we hear most often is number one <laughs> you can't build muscle on without animal protein so where did we get this idea from anyway? Sure, animals have flesh, muscle, and protein. That is true. <laughs> but that's not the only place that protein comes from. As a matter of fact, all of the essential amino acids that are required to make muscle are made by plants. Now, there are some microbes that uh, also make essential amino acids, but we don't sit down to a bowl of microbes for breakfast in the morning, do we? No, we eat food. And out of all the food we eat, animals do not and cannot make essential amino acids. So they do not actually make the essential amino acids you need to make muscle from. That only comes from plants. Now we get it from some of the dead microbes that live in our gut and things like this, but that's not where we're getting our dietary um, um, essential amino acids from. So the big question is, why are we taking the essential amino acids that plants make and then feeding them to an animal, then killing the animal to take the plant nutrients when we could get them directly from the plants instead? <laughs> It makes no sense whatever. It doesn't make sense economically. It doesn't make sense as our impact on the environment. And, and the poor animal gets killed for absolutely no reason. All I did was eat the plants that you fed it and you're just taking the, stealing the plant nutrients from the animal. So this makes no sense whatsoever. So uh, this is actually a diagram that you're seeing up on the screen right here of, um, of how plants actually make that. So there's, there's four main compounds carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Those four make up proteins. So the plants take in carbon dioxide, which we breathe out, all the animals do. It pulls that in, it's CO2. So that's two of them, carbon and oxygen. And then it needs hydrogen. Well, it gets that from water, H2O. So that's two hydrogen molecules. And then it puts those together through sunlight photosynthesis. And this is how it creates the basic molecule that we all use for all macronutrients. And that is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, more commonly known as a carbohydrate. Carbon, carbohydrate, water, it's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. That's where that word comes from, carbohydrate, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. That's it, water, carbohydrate. So a carbohydrate or glucose is the foundational molecule that everything else is made from pretty much. So all fats are made from this, all fiber is made from this, and all protein is made from this. So you've got that CHO, CHO, they call it in science, that carbon, hydrogen, oxygen molecule, which is a carbohydrate. And they can, you can put them all together and it creates starches. You can build even longer chains that can be fats. Or you can take it and add a nitrogen molecule or several nitrogen molecules to it, and that becomes a protein. So protein, when it goes into the system, can be broken down by knocking off that hydrogen and forming ammonia in our body and discarded and released through our urine or sweat. 
And this is how the body can actually take protein and turn it back into a fat or carbohydrate. So our body can do this all along. Plants start out with glucose as the foundational molecule for everything. It's funny when I hear people say, I'm on a low carb diet. No, no, everything is carbs, actually, everything. Fats are carbs, fiber is carbs, uh, protein is carbs. They're all based on the foundation of a carbohydrate molecule. Everything is, all the macronutrients. So there is no such thing as a low carb diet. <laughs> you, you reduce the carbs, you reduce everything. Protein is a carbohydrate with a nitrogen stuck onto it. So all of this is made by plants. There's no reason to do it. And then when we break this down, we release that carbon as carbon dioxide. And that's what we breathe out or we sweat H2O. Remember, that's what the plants use carbon dioxide and water to combine together to create your carbohydrate, fats, starches, and proteins with that nitrogen that they get either from the soil or from the air. Okay, so that's how it is. You can, all protein is it. Now, protein is different. So let's go ahead and, and uh, take a look at the next slide. So some proteins are different uh, and they have different of the different amino acids in it. So this was thought to be, well, not a good thing because plants can be lower compared to animal proteins. Well, this is true. But is that a good thing? Most of the research points to no, it is not necessarily a good thing. It may actually be a bad thing. And I'll show that to you in a minute. But first, let's look at these two studies, the effects of uh, eight weeks on whey or rice protein supplement in the body. The conclusions found, they found no difference between the amount of, uh, between consuming rice protein or whey protein. No difference, zero. Now, they did use a lot of the rice protein, and I'll get to that in a second as to why they do that, is because you just up the quantities to make up for any of the lower amounts of specific amino acids, in this case, lysine. All right, so they said, well, let's take a look at another plant protein, and they found pea proteins, and they combined, uh, compared um, pea protein uh, to whey protein. They actually found that pea protein actually increased muscle size by 33% more than whey. Now, it's because pea protein has actually more of the uh, essential amino acids per 100 grams than whey does, because whey is lopsided. Whey protein has a lot of leucine in it. And they used to think that's a good thing, but there's only 100 grams in 100 grams of protein. So if a lot of it is leucine, which is a growth stimulator for sure, um, but a, a lot of it, it means you're shortchanging some of the other essential amino acids. So you actually have more essential amino acids if that leucine is lower. The reason it's high in whey is because you've got a calf that is gonna grow from 80 pounds to 300 pounds in six months. The human beings in six months add about four to five pounds. Okay, not 300. And that's why the calf needs a much higher leucine content than humans do. Humans don't need that high leucine content. So plant proteins actually have more of the total essential amino acids because it's not so lopsided like leucine is. Yes, it stimulates muscle more. So a low dose of uh, whey protein would be more effective than a low dose. But once you get into higher doses, the plant protein actually becomes more effective because it has actually more essential amino acids in it that aren't leucine. And that's what the body needs, the complete essential amino acid profile. So this is really cool. And this is shown out in the study. So let's get to the second one that plants are incomplete proteins, incomplete. I'm sure you've all heard that plants are incomplete proteins. Where did this myth come from? It is completely false. Okay, but why do so many people still believe it? Even some scientists and researchers and doctors out there believe that plants are incomplete proteins. When they're not, plants produce all 20 amino acids. That's where they come from. And they produce all of the essential amino acids that animals do not. Animals don't and cannot produce any essential amino acid whatsoever. That's why we call them essential amino acids because it's essential for humans, just like all animals, to get them from our diet because we can't make them. It's impossible. Plants make them. Plants make the essential amino acids we need for muscle growth. They only come from plants. 
the, the essential amino acids you find in animal tissue came from plants. Either that plant was eaten by a rabbit and then eaten by a lion, but still it all originated or began in being created in a plant. So why kill the animals in the process to get something that you can get from there? Now, so they say, all right, but a couple of the amino acids are called sulfur amino acids. That's methionine and cysteine. Typically plant proteins uh, are generally lower in methionine and cysteine. So they thought, oh, this must be not as good, right? Because plant proteins don't have as much of methionine or cysteine in it. So that's inferior to, to animal proteins. Actually, just the opposite is true. We now know that it's better for humans to have lower amounts of methionine and cysteine in our diets. So this great study right here said a review of methionine dependency and the role of methionine restriction on cancer growth control and lifespan extension. So quote right from the study, in humans, vegan diets, which can be low in methionine, may prove to be a useful nutritional strategy in cancer growth control. Why? Because methionine is a growth stimulator. Our human bodies, once we reach adulthood, don't need a lot of growth stimulating uh, hormones or growth stimulating amino acids. Animal proteins are higher in that because some animals do require those for maximal growth, for a lot more growth. Obviously, if you're a calf going from 80 pounds to, <laughs> to 300 pounds, you need a lot of growth. So you'll need a lot more methionine, a lot more cysteine. These are growth stimulators. But what happens when you don't need growth and you send in a bunch of growth stimulating amino acids? Well, they stimulate the growth of cancer cells. They can do this. And that's when the growth of the cancer cells can spread to the body and metastasize. And this is where you can get into real trouble with cancers. And that's why this study is showing actually a reduction. They actually do this to people with cancer now these days. Doctors are prescribing people go on a low methionine diet to reduce the methionine, restrict, they're called methionine restriction uh, diets. And they actually have been very beneficial for people uh, with cancer. So these are amazing studies. And, and you can just Google it yourself. Just type in these three words, methionine dependent cancers. You will see that there are about 14 or 15 different cancers, including lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, the most lethal form of cancer that we know of. All of these cancers feed on methionine. They use methionine to grow. We put them in a Petri dish. Scientists have put them in a Petri dish, removed all the methionine or lowered it dramatically. Those, those cancer cells starve to death and die. This is a way you can actually reduce your risk for developing cancers by not putting these high amounts of methionine and cysteine that are found in meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. Uh, eggs and fish actually are the higher uh, amounts of methionine than anyone. So this is a big myth. It is not incomplete. All, pro all plant proteins have all 20 amino acids and have all nine essential amino acids. There are only two, <laughs> there are only two proteins that are actually dietary proteins that are technically truly incomplete. And that is two animal proteins, collagen and gelatin or bone broth. They are missing tryptophan or do not have enough tryptophan to keep a human being alive at edible dosages. So the only two incomplete proteins are both animal proteins. And they're really popular proteins right now. Collagen, which is an incomplete protein, and gelatin or bone broth, which is an incomplete protein. Those are the only true incomplete proteins in our dietary realm. No plants are incomplete proteins. All right. But our ancestors ate meat. Well, our ancestors raped women too as well. I don't think that's a good idea. Just because we did it in the past doesn't mean we should be doing it in the present. We did a lot of bonehead stuff and we did a lot of stuff that we don't need to now. We have farming and we have stores. We don't need to go out and kill anything just to stay alive. We have plenty of food in most countries. Obviously, there's some underdeveloped countries that do have starvation, but that's mostly about a political realm where the food distribution or greed or, or war is taking place. That's a man-made intervention. 
Okay, but what does the science say that human, our ancient ancestors, Homo sapiens sapiens, not Neanderthals or some other branch that, that didn't uh, evolve into us, but our true Homo sapiens sapiens, the same as human beings, just way early, 10,000 years or more ago. Okay, so this study is uh, looked at a bunch of studies. It's called caprolites. Caprolites are fossilized human poop. <laughs> and, and they can look in the poop and see what we ate. It's really kind of clear. So it's pretty and pretty definite about what human early human beings were actually eating. Now, this is what they found. And they look at four different continents and they found basically the same thing on all four different continents. So it wasn't specific to just an area or, or a, a group of humans. It was all over the world. So they looked in Africa. They averaged 120 grams of fiber per day. North America up to 225 grams of fiber per day in North America and Mexico. And in South America, 100 grams, and Australia, oh, well over 100 grams. So 100 grams of fiber, the average American today in modern America, the average rate of fiber intake is 10 to 15 grams. So they were eating 10 times, 10 to 20 times as many plant foods as modern humans are eating today. So if you're going to say, I won't, we should be eating like early human beings, then you need to start eating 10 times more plants than you're eating right now if you're on a basic omnivore diet. So this is ridiculous. And then I said, well, you know, what if this research isn't right? This is just looking at what they pooped out. Maybe they're just pooping out a lot of fiber. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the other end. <laughs> Well, this is interesting a study because this study actually looked at the dentation, the teeth. So fossilized teeth can have plaque, just like human, modern humans, we get plaque on our teeth. And in that plaque are oral microbiome, the microbes that were living in our mouth to help us digest the food we were eating, were actually getting stuck in the plaque. And we could look at their DNA and say, Wow, that was that was what our microbiome, our oral microbiome, the bacteria living in our mouths, were there. The, the higher the presence of plants, the higher presence of bacteria that would consume plants. The higher consumption of meat would mean that the higher bacteria. The number one most common bacteria that they found in fossilized um, teeth of early humans, now both Neanderthals and Homo sapiens sapiens, Cro-Magnons and all the other uh, Homo sapiens, this modern humans, just way back in early times, 60,000, 100,000 years ago, early hominids. So they looked at those and they looked at their teeth. Number one bacteria they had was starch eaters. So human beings way early were big time starch eaters. Now, the researchers in this particular study said, well, of course, that's how our brains exploded. Our brains are glucose hogs. 20 to 50% of all the glucose we consume goes straight to feeding our brain. That is why we develop our brain so slowly because it takes a lot of glucose to feed it, a lot of energy to feed it. But what is the best source of glucose of any of the plants? Starches. Starches have really dense, condensed, amounts of high amounts of glucose that would feed the brain as a matter of fact 60 percent of all of the calories modern humans still eat are, are starches basically and that's beans that's grains that's tubers and starchy vegetables all of those things have real dense amounts of glucose this is what helped us feed the brain allowed our brains to grow and get bigger whereas meat has practically no glucose whatsoever in it. Yes, it can be broken down into glucose, but it's a very slow and, and energy consuming process to do so. So it would actually take more energy than you'd actually be getting out of it. Not a very efficient way to grow a brain that requires almost dominantly glucose. Our, our, our brain is sucking up 20 to 50% of all of the glucose that we consume on a daily basis. It's amazing the amounts of glucose our brain feeds on. It's a really complex brain. It's mostly faceted and it is constantly big. And it's huge. It's, a, it's, a, it's an energy hog. Feeds almost exclusively on glucose. Okay, so our ancestors were actually eating starchy vegetables mostly, tubers and starchy vegetables 
and then they were eating a poop ton of fiber, to up to 225 grams of fiber. I challenge you to go on to one of the uh, like uh, my fitness pal or, or or you know chronometer or something and put your daily diet in there and see how close you are to 225 grams. That was on average what early human beings were eating. And you'd be surprised that they were eating massive amounts of plants. And when you're eating massive amounts of plants that are mostly fiber and water and lots of micronutrients, there's no room to put any animal products in there. You could be stuffed with plants. So almost indefinitely, yes, they were scavengers. If something was dead and they found it, they'd eat it. Um, they probably needed to cook it first because scavenging leads to bacteria, leads to parasites, so we kill humans back then. Um, so not a good, not a good approach. And of course, what are you going to do? You're going to waste a lot of energy trying to chase down or kill an animal, or are you going to lean down and pick up some berries, some nuts off that fall off a tree, or pull up, dig up some tubers and eat it? Yeah, that sounds to be like a much easier path, not spending a, a lot of energy. Okay, number four, stop eating the animals and the animals will overpopulate and run the world. Okay, in 1886, the invention of the automobile, people said, oh my God, if everybody switches, everybody's riding on horses for their mode of transportation, and carts or, or, or riding on horses. If everyone switches to these cars, Horses will just overpopulate and run wild in the streets. And yeah, that didn't happen either. <laughs> it happened gradually. As more cars were made, less horses were demand, less horses were bred, less horses were populated. So it slowly raised one and reduced the other. And now horses are running wild free in parts of the United States. And they're happy. They're not having to support uh, human beings riding on their backs anymore. Number five, vegans kill more animals than meat eaters. I'm like, where are they coming up with this crap? I'm serious. This is, okay, first off, vegans don't kill animals. That's, uh, that's the part of what a, being a vegan means. And they say, oh, but grain farmers kill mice with their harvesters. Yeah, and grain farmers actually eat animals too. <laughs> so, so, and they drive cars and hit bugs and animals. Yeah. That doesn't mean that I want them to do that. <laughs> when you eat meat, you are paying somebody to deliberately kill an animal so that you can eat it. That's the only way you can eat it, unless you eat animals live, which I don't think many people do. So you are actually paying someone to do that. We're paying them to provide vegetables for us, not to do it in a way that kills animals. That's their choice. That's their way. You could raise uh, produce without killing any animals. That is a farmer choice. That isn't, that isn't going to blame vegans for somebody else's killing of animals. I'm not paying them to kill animals. I don't want them to kill the animals. They are doing it because it's cheap and because they don't care. Um, okay, so retailers kill animals. We have to shop at stores too as well. Farmers do restaurants. A lot of restaurants that vegans have to go to because it's maybe the only one in the city will we'll provide uh, both animal products and some vegan products. So, you know, we don't have a lot of choices. We can't live in a vegan bubble. That's just not a reality in today's modern society. And of course, the harvester argument just disappears dramatically when you take into the account that 2.7 trillion sea life, that's fish and crustaceans, are killed every single year to feed humans. 2.7 trillion. And no, None of those are killed for vegans because vegans don't eat fish or anything out of the ocean. So no, that's not a reality either. And here's actually the definition. Veganism is a philosophy and a way of living that seeks to exclude. And this is the important part that I think a lot of people miss. As far as possible and practicable. That word practicable means is it practicable that you can actually do this without just totally uh, disrupting your entire life, whether it's your workplace or whether you're driving a car because of out of necessity and you hit bugs while you're driving a car? It's almost impossible to be truly non-killing of animals. If you have a house and a fly gets in and you don't know about it and it dies in your house, 
are you responsible for that? Come on, no, let's don't be silly. That's just silly. We're talking about the intention of not harming animals as far as possible and practicable. Number six, what if you were stranded on an island with a pig? <laughs> Okay, well, if I got stranded on an island and there was a pig there, the pig had to stay alive by eating something. <laughs> and obviously eating plants, most likely, because that's what supports all life. It's the bottom of the trophic order. So in science and biology, we have a, what's called a trophic order. Plants are the producers of nutrition. Then herbivores eat the plants and then carnivores eat the animals. And it's in a pyramid shape because there's more plants and you have to have more food supply than there are animals. Otherwise the animals would die back to be less than the food supply. That's supply and demand for you. And so at the very top, the smallest amount of animals are, are apex carnivores. Uh, they are the most dependent on everything else. If the, uh, if the herbivores die, so do the carnivores immediately. But if the carnivores die, the herbivores thrive. <laughs> so uh, herbivores can live without carnivores. Carnivores can't live without herbivores or without plants. So that's the big difference. So carnivores, apex carnivores, aren't the king of the, or the top of the, the, the pole, so to speak. They're the most dependent. They're the weakest of them. They're the first to die off when scarcity happens because they are so dependent on everything else in the food chain. They are actually the bottom of the food chain, not the top of the food chain. So being a lion is actually one of the worst places that you can be as far as being dependent for life, not the opposite. Herbivores, which depend on plants and not on other animals, is the best place to be. That's why there are much more herbivores than there are carnivores or even tiny amount of apex carnivores. Okay, so if you were if there was nothing else to eat then the pig wouldn't be able to eat either and therefore the pig wouldn't be there so this is just kind of a silly stupid question and of course if you were crash landed like humans were in incidents where their plane crashed in a frozen there was no plants to eat because everything was frozen solid and there were no animals to eat because it was up in the crash they crashed in the mountains where there was no animal life either because there was no plant life Remember, you have to have plant life for everything else to exist. Well, uh, obviously, those humans resorted to eating some of the uh, dead human beings as the only food source. Yes, that is what you do to stay alive. But that's not something you would do in <laughs> regular day-to-day -day life. You don't go to a grocery store and pick up dead humans frozen so that you can eat. No, you don't need to do that. So you don't do that. The same with the pig. No, I'm not stranded on a desert island. So no, I don't need to eat the pig. And no, I don't need to eat human beings because I'm not stranded in a, a, a frozen tundra either with only dead human beings sitting around. Let's stop with the silliness, all right? <laughs> okay, number seven, eating meat is masculine. Oh boy, just the opposite is actually true. Uh, so plant-based diets are associated with decreased risk of erectile dysfunction. And I don't know anything more masculine than being able to get an erection, right? If you can't get an erection, it's, that's, that's not real masculine. And we know that eating plants high in nitric oxide can open up the blood vessels that allow blood flow to the genital areas, both for men and women. We know that consuming cholesterol, animal cholesterol and saturated fat can clog arteries, decreasing blood flow to the genitalia, leading to nothing happening there. If there's no blood, it is a no-go, right? That is what erections are, is blood engorgement into the genitalia. So that would be bad enough. But also, just eating two and a half eggs, this was with a Harvard study, just eating two and a half eggs a week was associated with an 81% increased risk of prostate cancer. Now, this study actually showed that after prostate surgery, 
the impotence rate amongst men was 66 to 75%. Now, is eating two and a half eggs a week worth a risk of being 75% of men <laughs> emasculated having, after having prostate surgery because of the eggs? No, <laughs> oh my God, why would you give up the main attribute of being masculine, being able to have sexual relations or to bear children? Impotence, you are non-functional at this part. <laughs> that is the, the most emasculating part of life. So no, eating animal products does not make you masculine. Power over is not an attribute of men. If you look at the idols of men, what are the idols? Uh, a police officer is designed to protect the innocent, right? Uh, an army person is designed to protect the innocent, right? A fireman is designed to protect the innocent. That's what their duty is. That's masculine, protecting the innocent. Killing an innocent animal just for your taste buds, that is anti-masculine. Eating things that cause you to go limp, that's anti-masculine. Eating things that take away your prostate gland, that's anti-masculine. Eating things that, <laughs> that, that lead you to places of heart attack where you can't support your wife and kids, that is anti-masculine. Nothing about eating meat or eating animal products is masculine. Let's stop the BS. It's not scientifically true. And it's a myth that is killing men. And it's time we stand up and show what real masculinity is, protect the innocent, live healthy, strong uh, sexual lives, even into the ripe ages of life. That's what you can get by eating plants. And it's clinically shown to be true. Okay, a plant-based diet is restrictive. <laughs> oh, my God. There's about a dozen different animals that human beings eat on a regular basis, and there's over 200,000 known edible plants on this earth. <laughs> oh, such a silly thing. I mean, this stuff, these, these excuses are so freaking lame. It's pathetic. 200,000 edible plants, and you got to eat a dozen animals? I mean, chicken, fish, uh, poultry, basically. So that's chicken, turkey, whatever. Uh, fish, eggs, dairy, beef, lamb. What else is there? Yeah, I don't know. Sheep. Uh, I, you know, there's just only a handful of animals. You can count them on hands and toes that human beings, and especially modern Americans, are eating. Yet 200,000 plants on this planet we can eat. That's just silly. Okay, but processed food and carbs on a plant-based diet. Okay, the standard American diet has plenty of processed food and isolated carbs. This is not exclusive uh, or only in happening in a plant-based diet. And neither uh, processed foods or isolated carbs are part of a whole food plant exclusive diet. You do not have to eat processed foods. You do not have to be a junk food vegan. That is not a requirement of changing to eating plants. It's really simple. Regardless of whether you eat an omnivore diet or a plant exclusive diet, they're both better off by consuming less or no processed foods, isolated carbs or isolated fats. Just leave them out of the diet. There's so much other foods to eat. I eat almost dominantly a whole food plant-based diet, but because I do so, I can throw in an occasional processed food like a Beyond Burger or something like that, enjoy it and it not really have a negative, much of a negative impact on my diet. Actually, a much less negative than if eating a real hamburger full of heme iron, uh, causation of TMAO, uh, the high fat and cholesterol, the saturated fat and cholesterol. I could go on and on and on about the negative effects of eating an animal-based diet, but that's not this. Let's get on to the final one. Number 10, but lions eat meat. <laughs> okay, lions are carnivores. Human beings are not physiological carnivores. We're not. We know this. It's scientific fact. Let's stop with the BS comparison to, <laughs> to animals that are carnivores. Okay, so let's look at some of the, dif uh, the differences between a carnivore. Carnivores and herbivores. Uh, omnivores, not really a thing for requirements. So all 
carnivores are required to get their protein from uh, animal products. And I'll explain that with a little bit of detail and an asterisk in a second. And all herbivores are required to get them from plants. Let's, so let's take, there are two essential nutrients that all of these animals have to get, humans included. Um, essential fatty acids and essential amino acids. So the essential fats, omegas, omega-3 and omega-6, and essential amino acids, your nine essential amino acids. So let's look at the differences. So carnivores cannot make taurine. So it is an essential amino acid. So there's 10 essential amino acids for carnivores, nine for herbivores. Guess what, which one humans fall into. Okay, so carnivores need taurine. They can't, their body cannot make them. It's impossible. And plants do not make taurine. So the only place a carnivore can get taurine that it needs for survival is another animal. Now, in cats, we can actually add taurine made in a chem chemical laboratory, so it doesn't require any animal. Yes, that's possible. I'm not stating that. I'm saying in nature, in the wild, carnivore animals are required to get taurine from other eating other animals because plants do not make taurine. And so humans and all herbivores make their own taurine. So carnivores don't make taurine. All herbivores do make taurine. Which of these two classes do humans belong to? Now, I know most of you are going to say, oh, we fall in the middle in omnivores. Well, <laughs> okay, so there is no actual real requirement for omnivore. This means eating plants and animals. There's no human requirement for human beings for any nutrient that comes exclusively from an animal. So there's no requirement, that's the key word here, required for survival. Herbivores require plant nutrients for survival. Carnivores require animal nutrients for survival. Omnivores, yeah, they don't require plants and animals. Omnivores either require plants or require only uh, um, animals. So they some animal some animals like dogs have become omnivores through adaptation processes where they can get nutrients from both but it's not required so omnivore is not a required diet and what we need to do is say what is required for humans all right so humans make all their own taurine it is not an essential animal for any herbivore including humans plants make all of the essential amino acids that herbivores require, including humans. They do not make all of the essential amino acids that carnivores um, require. So this is the big difference between the two. Now, there are other big differences too. Carnivores um, do not convert. So all fish and carnivores do not convert ALA, the plant omega-3, down into EPA and DHA. They can't do this. They've lost that ability. Uh, they may have never had that ability. But all herbivores convert ALA down to EPA and DHA. Guess where humans fall again? Bingo, once again. So whether it's essential amino acids, herbivores and all humans get them from plants. Whether it's essential Fatty acids, omega-3s and omega-6, the only two essential fatty acids. And guess what the two essential fatty acids, omega-3 and omega-6 are? It's not EPA. It's not DHA. They are not essential because we can make our own. EPA is essential for carnivores. It is not essential for herbivores, including humans, because we can make our own. The only essential fatty acids, omega-3, is ALA. That's one and only essential omega-3 for humans and all other herbivores. For carnivores, that essential omega is EPA. Very different essential omega, ALA here for herbivores and humans, and for carnivores, it's EPA. So really different. Even the omega-6s are different too. LA, for LA, for plants, which ALA and LA omega-6, 
uh, ALA omega-3, LA omega-6, both come from plants. They don't come from animals. And here, dietary arachidonic acid, which animals need, gets it from the animals. That's an omega-6. If we get arachidonic acid from our diet, which only comes from animals, plants do not make arachidonic acid. When we eat the arachidonic acid that's in animal tissue, that's an omega-6, it becomes pro-inflammatory in us. They found the highest rates of Alzheimer's also had the highest rates of arachidonic dietary arachidonic acid. That is animal-based sourced arachidonic acid because plants don't make it. Animal dietary arachidonic acid, the higher amounts led to inflammation of the brain, led to inflammation of the arteries, greater amounts of cardiovascular disease, uh, greater amounts of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So we can see whether it's cholesterol, arachidonic acid, only from animals, both plants don't make cholesterol, don't make arachidonic acid. So they fed cholesterol to 100% of the animals they tested in the laboratory. They tested all kinds of animals that were herbivores. And 100% of herbivores got uh, atherosclerosis, okay? So they fed saturated fat and, and cholesterol to a carnivore animal and said, well, is it going to get the same disease humans do? No, they don't. So they found out that carnivores actually produce something from their thyroid gland that prevents them from getting atherosclerotic plaques in their arteries from consuming uh, saturated fat and cholesterol. All herbivores, if you give them saturated fat and cholesterol, it will result in atherosclerosis. Guess what the killer, the number one killer of human beings is? atherosclerosis. Guess where we're getting it from? Because we're an herbivore eating animals, which we shouldn't be eating because we're eating saturated fat and cholesterol. We don't have that enzyme or, or chemical compound produced by our thyroid gland because we're an herbivore. None of the herbivores have that. As a matter of fact, if you take carnivores and you remove that thyroid gland, they will get atherosclerosis just like humans do. It's that thyroid gland that they actually produce something different that helps them consume saturated fat and cholesterol because they're consuming other animals. And that protects them from dying from disease states. When herbivores consume animals, that's not what they're supposed to eat. And it ends up killing them through atherosclerotic plaques, plaques to the arteries, plaques to the brain, causing stroke, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, plaques to the genitalia, causing erectile dysfunction, plaques to the heart causing heart attacks and cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease. This is really clear which dietary pattern is made for us. I hope you enjoyed some of these debunking of this. There's so many more. I have tons of videos. Check out our YouTube channel at Clean Machine Online. I debunked lectins, oxalates, phytates, vitamin B12, uh, vitamin D3, vitamin K2, which they say because only comes from animals. It does not. <laughs> it's just not. Animals don't make vitamin K2. It's made by the gut bacteria of all animals, including humans. And that's, uh, if you're low in, in vitamin K2, it, it's, a, it's an evidence that you're not feeding enough fiber because that's what the bacteria that produce vitamin K2 feed upon is fiber. Not eating enough fiber, you reduce your amount of bacteria that converts K1 to K2. Also, guess what's in that fiber? Those dark green plants, high amounts of vitamin K1. A thousand percent of the K1 that your body needs is made by these green plants. That is where 70 to 90 percent of our vitamin K comes from. And then it is converted by our microbiome into vitamin K2. So for a healthy microbiome vegan, there is absolute eating good amounts of dark greens on a daily basis. There's no reason for you should have any vitamin K2 deficiency. Obviously, talk to your doctor about it. Get your blood tested to make sure you're not. And because there's all different types of situations that this, this is not medical advice. This is me talking about the science. So check out some of these other great videos that I've done debunking all these different things that people use as excuses of why not to change. Look, I do this not to shame or, or make anybody wrong. I do this because I care about your health and I want you to understand how physiology works. 
how our science, what our science is telling us about how our body works, what makes our body healthy, what we can put in our bodies to get the best results, because I want the best health for you. I don't want you to suffer. I don't want you to die. Look, I'm 60 years of age. I lost my mother, my brother, and my father, all dead by the time they were 60, before they were 60. I don't want you to experience that. It was horrible. It, it destroyed me. I went into a deep depression over those losing my family like that. I don't wish that on anybody. And I want to, I've learned so much about health and nutrition by reading the research. I want to share this information so that you don't have to suffer, that you and your family have the best health outcomes possible by making better choices for your health. But it also helps the animals. It helps the environment. There's so much good doing out of this. That is why I formed Clean Machine to, to bring some of these amazing plants to market, allow you to have some choices that are healthy, that are natural, that are even organic with our natural uh, USDA organic vitamin D3 option now. I want to bring the best of the best to improve your health and give you what's better for you. And please stay away from the drugs, keep your body clean, be healthy, thrive even at the uh, ripe old age, 60, 70 and beyond, and let's enjoy life to the fullest. Thanks for watching. Please give us a thumbs up, subscribe. YouTube has been uh, really getting cracking down on health related videos. So please share so we can get this information out. Please subscribe so we can get more viewers watching this and getting the good information they need to make the best choices for you. I'm not telling you what to eat. I'm showing you what the research is saying, what our physiology is saying, what our body is saying, so that you can make the best choices for yourself, whatever they are. And then you can also make good choices for the animals that we share this planet with, as well as the wonderful environment that supports all life on this planet. Thanks for watching and give it a thumbs up. If you like it, share it. If you can, uh, let's get more people informed so that they can enjoy their life to the best and healthiest. Thanks for joining me.